You are listening to post-production audiobook presentation of Billy Budd, Sailor, by Herman Melville. In the time before steamships, a stroller along the docks of any seaport would occasionally have his attention arrested by a group of bronzed mariners, merchant sailors, ashore on liberty. In certain instances, they would flank or, like a bodyguard, surround some superior figure of their own class. That object was the handsome sailor, with no perceptible trace of the vainglorious about him, rather with the offhand unaffectedness of natural regality. He seemed to accept the spontaneous homage of his shipmates. The handsome sailor invinced nothing dandified. Proficient in his perilous calling, he was also a mighty boxer. It was strength and beauty. Tales of his prowess were recited. Ashore he was the champion, afloat the spokesman. Close reefing topsails in a gale, there he was, astride the weather, a superb figure, tossed up as by the horns of Taurus against the thunderous sky. The moral nature was seldom out of keeping with the physical make. Indeed, except as toned by the former comeliness and power, hardly could have drawn the sort of honest homage the handsome sailor received from his less gifted associates. Such a Sinosia in aspect and in nature was Billy Budd, or Baby Budd, aged 21, a foretopman of the British fleet toward the close of the last decade of the 18th century. It was not very long prior that he had entered the King's service, having been impressed from a homeward-bound English merchantman into an outward-bound HMS Indomitable, which had put to sea short of her proper complement of men. Upon Billy, at first sight, the boarding officer, Lieutenant Ratcliffe, pounced, even before the merchantman's crew was formally mustered on the quarter-deck for his inspection, and him only he elected. Whether it was because the other men, when ranged before him, showed to ill advantage after Billy, or whether he had some scruples as the merchantman was rather short-handed, the officer contented himself with his first choice. To the surprise of the ship's company, though much to the lieutenant's satisfaction, Billy made no demur. But indeed, any demur would have been as idle as the protest of a goldfinch popped into a cage. Noting this uncomplaining acquiescence, the shipmates turned a surprised glance of silent reproach at the sailor. The shipmaster was one of those worthy mortals whom everybody agrees is a respectable man. Though a ploughman of the troubled waters, there was nothing this honest soul at heart loved better than peace and quiet. He was fifty, a little inclined to corpulence, a prepossessing face, unwhiskered and intelligent in expression. On a fair day with a fair wind and all going well, a sudden musical chime in his voice seemed to be the veritable, unobstructed outcome of the innermost man. He had much prudence, much conscientiousness, and there were occasions when these virtues were the cause of disquietude in him. So long as his craft was in proximity to land, there was no sleep for Captain Graveling. He took to heart the serious responsibilities of shipmasters. Now, while Billy Budd was down in the forecastle getting his kit together, the indomitable's lieutenant, burly and bluff, nowise disconcerted by Captain Gravelin's omitting to proffer the customary hospitalities, unceremoniously invited himself into the cabin and also to a flask from the spirit locker, which his experienced eye instantly discovered. In fact, he was one of those sea dogs in whom the hardship and peril of naval life or prolonged wars never impaired the instinct for sensuous enjoyment. His duty he always faithfully did, but duty is sometimes dry, and he was for irrigating its aridity, whensoever possible, with strong waters. For the cabin's proprietor, there was nothing left but to play the part of the enforced host. He silently placed tumbler and water jug before the guest. He watched the unembarrassed officer deliberately diluting his grog, then tossing it off in three swallows, pushing the empty tumbler away, settling himself in his seat and smacking his lips with... The master broke the silence. There lurked a rueful reproach in his voice. Lieutenant, you are going to take my best man. I know, rejoined the other, immediately drawing back the tumbler to replenish it. Sorry. You don't understand, Lieutenant... Before that young fellow, my forecastle was a rat pit of quarrels. It was black times aboard the rights. But Billy came, and it was like a Catholic priest striking peace in an Irish shindy. Not that he preached to them or did anything in particular, but a virtue went out of him, sugaring the sour ones. They took to him like hornets to treacle. All but the big shaggy chap with the fire red whiskers. He out of envy, perhaps, and thinking such a sweet fellow, as he mockingly designated him, could hardly have the spirit of a gamecock. Tried to get up an ugly row with him. B. 
Billy forbore and reasoned with him in a pleasant way, but nothing served. So one day, Red Whiskers insultingly gave Billy a dig under the ribs. Quick as lightning, Billy let fly his arm. I dare say he never meant to do quite as much as he did, but he gave the burly fool a terrible drubbing. It took about half a minute. The lubber was astonished, and Red Whiskers now really loves Billy. They all love him. Some of them do his washing or darn his old trousers for him. Anybody will do anything for Billy Bud. It's the happy family here. But if that young fellow goes, I know how it will be aboard the rights. You are going to take away my peacemaker. Well, said the officer who had listened with amused interest, blessed are the peacemakers, especially the fighting peacemakers, and such are the seventy-four beauties of yonder warship, pointing through the cabin window at the indomitable. Don't look so downhearted. His Majesty will be delighted in a time when his hard tack is not sought by sailors, a time when some shipmasters resent the borrowing of a tar or two for the service, to learn that one shipmaster cheerfully surrenders to the king the flower of his flock, a sailor who, with equal loyalty, makes no dissent. The lieutenant glanced through the cabin's open door, spying Billy. Here comes Apollo with his portmanteau. The lieutenant stepped out. Billy! You can't take that big box aboard a warship. Put your duds in a bag. The transfer made, the lieutenant pushed off from the rights of man, the merchant ship's name. But when the boat swept under the merchantman's stern, the new recruit jumped up, waving his hat to his silent shipmates sorrowfully looking at him, and bade the lads a genial goodbye, then making a salutation to the ship herself. Goodbye to you too, rights of man. Down, sir! roared the lieutenant, instantly assuming all the rigour of his rank, though with difficulty repressing a smile. To be sure, Billy's actions was a terrible breach of naval decorum, but in that decorum he had never been instructed. As to his enforced enlistment, maybe he rather liked this adventurous turn in his affairs. Aboard the Indomitable, our merchant sailor was rated an able seaman and assigned to the starboard watch of the foretop. He was soon at home in the service, not at all disliked for his unpretentious good looks and genial air. In marked contrast, other individuals impressed into the ship's company were apt to fall into sullenness. But they were not so young as our four topmen, and may have had wives and children left in uncertain circumstances. Billy Budd was young, and despite his fully developed frame, looked even younger than he really was, owing to a lingering adolescent expression in the smooth face. The abrupt transition to the more knowing world of a great warship might have abashed him had there been any conceit in his composition. As the handsome sailor, Billy Budd's position aboard the 74 was analogous to that of a rustic beauty transplanted into the high-born dames of court. But this change of circumstances he scarce noted. Cast in a mould peculiar to the finest physical examples, his face showed humane good nature. But this was subtly modified by another and pervasive quality. The shapely ear, the arch of foot, the curve in mouth. But, above all, something in the mobile expression. All this strangely indicated a lineage in direct contradiction to his lot. The mysteriousness became less mysterious when Billy, being formally mustered into the service, was asked his place of birth. I don't know. Then who was your father? God knows, sir. Struck by the straightforward simplicity of these replies, the officer asked, Do you know anything about your beginning? I was found in a pretty silk-lined basket by a good man's door in Bristol. Found? Well, looking up and down the new recruit, it turns out to have been a good find. Hope they'll find more like you. The fleet needs them. Billy Budd was a foundling, a by-blow, and evidently no ignoble one. Noble descent was evident in him. He possessed the intelligence of a sound human creature, yet he was illiterate. Of self-consciousness, he seemed to have none. Habitually living with the elements and knowing little of land, his simple nature remained unsophisticated by moral obliquities. Billy, in many respects, was little more than an upright barbarian, much as Adam might have been ere the urbane serpent wriggled into his company. Though our handsome sailor had as much masculine beauty as one can expect anywhere to see, Nevertheless, there was one thing amiss in him. No visible blemish, but an occasional vocal defect. 
Though in the hour of elemental uproar or peril he was everything that a sailor should be, yet under sudden provocation of strong heart feeling, his voice otherwise singularly musical, as if expressive of the harmony within, was apt to develop an organic hesitancy, a stutter. In every case, one way or another, the envious interferer of Eden is sure to slip in his little card as much as to remind us, I too have a hand here. Such an imperfection in the handsome sailor is not alone evidence that he is not presented as a conventional hero, but also that the story in which he is the main figure is no romance. At the time of Billy Budd's arbitrary enlistment into the Indomitable, that ship was on her way to join the Mediterranean fleet. The 74, on account of her superior sailing qualities, was dispatched as a scout. It was the summer of 1797. In April of that year occurred the commotion at Spithead, followed in May by a more serious outbreak in the fleet at the Nore, the Great Mutiny. It was a demonstration more menacing to England than the conquering armies of the French. To the British Empire, the Nore Mutiny was what a strike in the fire brigade would be to London, threatened by arson. In a crisis, reasonable discontent grown out of practical grievances in the fleet had been ignited into irrational combustion. Though after parleyings between government and the ringleaders and concessions by the former as to glaring abuses, the first uprising at Spithead was pacified. Yet, at the Nore, the unforeseen renewal of insurrection on a larger scale and the demands deemed by authorities not only inadmissible but also aggressively insolent indicated the spirit animating the men. Final suppression was only made possible by the unswerving loyalty of the Marine Corps and the voluntary resumption of loyalty among influential sections of the crews. To some extent, the Nor mutiny may be regarded as a distempering eruption of contagious fever in a frame constitutionally sound. At all events, these thousands of mutineers helped to win a coronet for Nelson at the Nile and at Trafalgar. To the mutineers, those battles, especially Trafalgar, were an absolution and a grand one, for those battles stand unmatched in human annals for heroic magnificence in arms. Yes, the outbreak at the Nore was put down, but not every grievance was redressed. If the contractors, for example, were no longer providing shoddy cloth, rations not sound or force in measure, impressment still went on. By custom sanctioned for centuries, that mode of manning the fleet was not practicable to give up in those years. Its abrogation would have crippled the fleet, its innumerable sails and thousands of cannons worked by muscle alone. Discontent foran the two mutinies, and it lurkingly survived them. Hence it was not unreasonable to apprehend some return of trouble. But on board the 74, in which Billy now swung his hammock, very little would have suggested to an ordinary observer that the great mutiny was a recent event. In their general bearing and conduct, the commissioned officers of a warship naturally take their tone from the commander. Captain Edward Fairfax Vere was a bachelor of 40, a sailor of distinction even in a time prolific of renowned seamen. Though allied to the higher nobility, his advancement had not been altogether owing to influence. He had seen much service, always acquitting himself as an officer mindful of the welfare of his men, but never tolerating an infraction of discipline thoroughly versed in the science of his profession. Ashore in the garb of a civilian, scarce anyone would have taken him for a sailor, and noting the silent deference of the officers might have taken him for some highly honourable envoy on his way to an important post. Aside from his qualities as a sea officer, Captain Vere was an exceptional character. Unlike no few of England's renowned sailors, long and arduous service with signal devotion to it had not resulted in absorbing and salting the entire man. He had a marked leaning toward everything intellectual. He loved books, never going to sea without a newly replenished library. Compact, but of the best. The isolated leisure, in some cases so wearisome, falling at intervals to commanders even during a war cruise, never was tedious to Captain Veer. His bias was toward those books to which every serious mind of superior order occupying any active post of authority in the world naturally inclines. Books treating of actual men and events no matter of what era, history, biography and unconventional writers who honestly philosophize upon realities. With minds less earnest, some officers of his rank found him a dry and bookish gentleman. Vere is a noble fellow, and there is scarce a better seaman or fighter, but there is a queer streak of the pedantic running through him. 
The captain's discourse never fell into the jocosely familiar, but in illustrating any point he would cite some historic character or incident of antiquity, unmindful of how that may be alien to men whose reading was mainly confined to the journals. Among the petty officers was one John Claggett, the master at arms. Originally, that petty officer's function was the instruction of the men in the use of arms. But long ago, owing to advances in gunnery, making hand-to-hand encounters less frequent, that function ceased. The master-at-arms of a great warship became a sort of chief of police, charged with the duty of preserving order on the populous lower gun decks. Claggett was a man about five and thirty, somewhat spare and tall, yet of no ill figure upon the whole. His hand was too small and shapely to have been accustomed to hard toil. The face was a notable one, the features all except the chin, cleanly cut, yet the chin, beardless, had a strange protuberant heaviness. His brow, associated with more than average intellect, silken jet curls partly clustered over it, making a foil to the pallor below, a pallor tinged with a faint shade of amber. This complexion, contrasting with the deeply bronzed visages of the sailors, though not exactly displeasing, nevertheless seemed to hint of something defective in the constitution and blood. Nevertheless, his general aspect and manner were suggestive of an education and high quality, social and moral. Nothing was known of his former life. It might be that he was an Englishman, and yet there lurked a bit of accent in his speech, suggesting that possibly he was not such by birth, but through naturalisation in early childhood. Among certain grizzled sea gossips of the gun decks went a rumour that the master-at-arms was a chevalier who volunteered into the navy because of a mysterious swindle. The fact that nobody could substantiate this report was nothing against its secret co- Such a rumour, once started, would seem not altogether wanting in credibility. Indeed, a man of Claggett's accomplishments, without prior nautical experience, entering the Navy at mature life as he did, and allotted the lowest grade in it, a man too who never made allusion to his previous life ashore, these were circumstances which in the dearth of exact knowledge as to his true antecedents open the field for unfavourable surmise. But the sailor's gossip concerning him derived a vague plausibility from the fact that now, for some period, the British Navy could so little afford to be squeamish in the matter of keeping up the muster rolls. That not only were press gangs notoriously abroad both afloat and ashore, but the London police were at liberty to capture any able-bodied suspect, any questionable fellow, and summarily ship him to dockyard. Furthermore, Even among voluntary enlistments, there were instances where the motive partook neither of patriotic impulse nor of a desire to experience sea life and martial adventure. Insolvent debtors, together with the immoral, found the Navy a convenient and secure refuge. Secure because once enlisted aboard a king's ship, they were as much in sanctuary as the transgressor of the Middle Ages harbouring himself under the shadow of the altar. For a warship short of hands, the deficient quota would be eked out by drafts culled direct from the jails. But less credence was given to the gun-deck talk touching Claggett, seeing that no man holding his office in a man-of-war can ever hope to be popular with the crew. Besides, in derogatory comments upon anyone against whom they have a grudge or mislike, sailors, like landsmen, are apt to exaggerate it. About as much was really known to the indomitable stars of the master-at-arms career before entering the service as an astronomer knows about a comet's travels prior to its first observable appearance in the sky. It was no gossip, however, but fact that though Claggett, upon his entrance into the Navy, was assigned to the least honourable section of the crew, embracing the drudgery, he did not long remain there. The superior capacity he immediately invinced, his constitutional sobriety, and ingratiating deference to superiors, all this capped by a certain austere patriotism abruptly advanced him to the position of master-at-arms. Of this maritime chief of police, the ship's corporals were the immediate subordinates, compliant almost to a degree inconsistent with moral volition. The influence under the chief's control, capable when astutely worked through his understrappers, of operating to the mysterious discomfort of any of the sailors. Life in the foretop agreed with Billy Budd. There, when not actually engaged on the yards, the topmen constituted an aerial club lounging at ease against the smaller stun sails rolled up into cushions, spinning yarns like the lazy gods and frequently amused with what was going on in the busy world of the decks below. 
No wonder that a young fellow of Billy's disposition was content in such society. Giving no cause of offence to anybody, he was always alert, with such a punctiliousness in duty that his topmates would sometimes good-naturedly laugh at him for it. This heightened alacrity was caused by the impression made by the first formal gangway punishment he had ever witnessed, the day following his impressment. It had been incurred by a fellow, a novice, absent from his assigned post, which is a dereliction. When Billy saw the culprit's naked back under the scourge gridironed with red by the executioner, he was horrified. He resolved that never through remissness would he make himself liable to such a visitation or merit even verbal reproof. What then was his surprise and concern when ultimately he found himself getting into petty trouble about the stowage of his bag or something amiss in his hammock, matters under the police oversight of the ship's corporals of the lower decks and which brought down on him a vague threat? How could this be? He could not understand it, and it vexed him. When he spoke to his young topmates about it, they were either lightly incredulous or found something comical in his unconcealed anxiety. Well, sew yourself up in your bag and then you'll know if anybody meddles. Now there was a veteran aboard who was assigned duty as main mastman. At off times the four topmen had picked up some acquaintance with him, and now in his trouble it occurred to him that he might be the sort of person to go to for wise counsel. He was an old dansker of few words, many wrinkles and some honourable scars. His wizened face, time-tinted and weather-stained to the complexion of antique parchment, was peppered blue by the chance explosion of a gun cartridge in action. Now, the first time that his small weasel eyes happened to light on Billy Bud, a certain grim internal merriment set all his ancient wrinkles into antic play. Was it that his eccentric, unsentimental sapience saw something which, in contrast with the warship's environment, looked oddly incongruous in the handsome sailor? but after slyly studying him, the old Merlin's equivocal merriment was replaced by speculative query as to what might eventually befall a nature like that, dropped into a world not without man-traps and against whose subtleties simple courage, lacking like experience and defensive ugliness, is of little avail. However it was, the Dansker took to Billy. While the old man's eccentricities repelled the juniors, Billy, revering him as a sort hero, would never pass without a salutation marked by respect. There was a vein of dry humour in the masked man. From the first in addressing him, he always substituted Baby for Billy, the name by which the foretopman eventually became known aboard ship. Well then, in his mysterious little difficulty, going in quest of the wrinkled one, Billy found him off duty, seated on the upper gun deck. Billy recounted his trouble. The salt seer attentively listened. The old man laconically said, Baby bud, Jimmy Legs, meaning master at arms, is down on you. Jimmy Legs, ejaculated Billy, his eyes expanding. What for? Why, he calls me the sweet and pleasant fellow. Does he? grinned the grizzled one. Aye, baby lad, a sweet voice as Jimmy Legs. To me he has. I seldom pass him, but there comes a pleasant word. And that's because he's down upon you, baby bud. Such reiteration along with the manner of it, incomprehensible to a novice, disturbed Billy almost as much as the mystery for which he had sought explanation. The old sea Chiron, thinking perhaps that he had sufficiently instructed his young Achilles, pursed his lips, gathered his wrinkles together, and would commit himself to nothing further. The next day, an incident served to confirm Billy Budd in his incredulity as to the Dansker's strange summing up of the case. The ship at noon, going large before the wind, was rolling, and he, below at dinner, chanced in a sudden lurch to spill the entire contents of his soup pan upon the new scrubbed deck. Claggett, the master-at-arms, happened to be passing when the greasy liquid streamed across his path. Stepping over it, he was proceeding on his way without comment, since the matter was nothing to take notice of under the circumstances, when he happened to observe who it was that had done the spilling. His countenance changed. Pausing, he checked himself, and pointing down to the streaming soup, playfully tapped him from behind with his rattan, saying in a low musical voice, Handsomely done, my lad. Handsome is as handsome did it too. And with that passed on. Not noted by Billy was the involuntary grimace that accompanied Claggett's equivocal words. Aridly, it drew down the thin corners of his shapely mouth. 
Everybody taking his remark as humorous and coming from a superior was bound to laugh with counterfeited glee. Billy, tickled by the allusion to his being the handsome sailor, merrily joined in. Then, addressing his messmates, exclaimed, Now, who says Jimmy Legs is down on me? Who said he was beauty? demanded one Donald with surprise. Whereat the four topmen looked a little foolish, recalling that it was only one, the dansker who had suggested the idea that this master at arms was hostile. Meantime, Claggett, resuming his path, must have momentarily worn some expression less guarded than that of the bitter smile, some distorting expression for a drummer boy heedlessly frolicking along from the opposite direction, coming into light collision with his person, was strangely disconcerted by his aspect. Nor was the impression lessened when the official, impulsively given him a sharp cut with the rattan, vehemently exclaimed, Look where you go! How could the master-at-arms be down on Billy Budd? And as the chance encounter indicated, secretly down on him, who, prior to the affair of the spilled soup, he had never come into any special contact. To invent something involving Billy Budd, of which the latter should be wholly ignorant, some romantic incident implying Claggett's knowledge of the young blue jacket began anterior to catching sight of him on board the 74, might account for whatever enigma may appear to lurk in the case. But there was nothing of the sort. Yet what can more partake of the mysterious than an antipathy spontaneous and profound, evoked in certain exceptional mortals by the mere aspect of some other mortal, however harmless he may be? Aboard a warship, every day among all ranks, almost every man comes into contact with almost every other man. Wholly there to avoid even the sight of an aggravating object, one must jump overboard. Though Claggett's even temper and discreet bearing would seem to intimate a mind peculiarly subject to the law of reason, his heart seemed to riot in complete exemption from that law, further than to employ it to affect the irrational, toward the accomplishment of a name which in wantonness of malignity seemed to partake of the insane, he will direct sound judgment. These are madmen of the most dangerous sort, for their lunacy is not continuous but occasional, evoked by some special object. It is probably secretive, self-contained, so that when most active, it is to the average mind, not distinguishable as the aim is never declared. The outward proceeding are always perfectly rational. In Claggett, the mania of an evil nature not engendered by vicious training, corrupting books, or licentious living was innate. Claggett's figure was not amiss, and he was not only neat but careful in his dress. But the former Billy Budd was heroic, and if his face was without the intellectual look of the pallid Claggett's, the bonfire in his heart made luminous the rose tan in his cheek. In view of the marked contrast between them, it is more than probable that when the master-at-arms applied to the sailor the proverb, handsome is as handsome does, he there let escape an ironic inkling, not caught by the young sailors, as to what it was that had first moved him against Billy, his significant personal beauty. Now envy and antipathy, passions irreconcilable in reason, nevertheless in fact may spring co-joined like Chang and Eng in one birth. Is envy such a monster? Well, though many an arraigned mortal has in hopes of mitigated penalty pleaded guilty to horrible actions, did ever anybody seriously confess to envy? Something in it, universally felt, is more shameful than even felonious crime. Not only does everybody disown it, but the better sort are inclined to incredulity when it is in earnest imputed to an intelligent man. But since its lodgments is in the heart, not the brain, no degree of intellect supplies a guarantee against it. But Claggett's was no vulgar form of the passion. Claggett's envy struck deeper. If askance he eyed the good looks, cheery health and frank enjoyment of young life in Billy Budd, it was because these went along with a nature that, as Claggett felt, had in its simplicity never willed malice or experienced the reactionary bite of that serpent. To him, the spirit lodged within Billy, and looking out from his eyes, dimpled his dyed cheek, suppled his joints, and danced in his yellow curls, making him preeminently the handsome sailor. The master-at-arms appreciated the moral phenomenon presented in Billy Bud. 
The insight intensified his passion, which, assuming various secret forms within him, at times assumed that of cynic disdain, disdain of innocence, to be nothing more than innocent. Yet, in an aesthetic way, he saw the charm of it, the courageous, free and easy temper of it, and fame would have shared it, but he despaired of it. With no power to annul the elemental evil in him, apprehending the good, but powerless to be it, he could hide it. Passion, in its profoundest, is enacted down among the groundlings, among the beggars and rakers of the garbage. The circumstances that provoke it, however trivial, are no measure of its power. In the present instance, the stage is a scrubbed gun deck, and one of the external provocations, a man of war's man's spilled soup. Now, when the master at arms noticed that greasy fluid streaming before his feet, he must have taken it, willfully perhaps, not for the mere accident it was, but for the sly escape of a spontaneous feeling on Billy's, answering his own antipathy. So into the gall of his envy, Claggett infused the vitriol of his contempt, but the incident confirmed certain reports by Squeak, one of his more cunning corporals, a grizzled little man of squeaky voice and sharp visage, who ferreted about the dark corners of the lower decks after interlopers, like a rat in a cellar. From his chiefs employing him to lay traps for the foretopman, for it was from the master-at-arms that the petty persecutions proceeded, the corporal naturally concluded that his master had no love for the sailor, and made it his business to ferment the ill blood by perverting certain innocent frolics of the good-natured foretopman and inventing epithets he claimed to have overheard. The master-at-arms never suspected the veracity of these reports, for he knew how secretly unpopular became a zealous master-at-arms, and how the blue jackets shoot at him in private their raillery and their wit, his nickname among them, Jimmy Legs, implying, under the form of merriment, their disrespect and dislike. Depravity has everything to hide. In case of a suspected injury, its secretiveness voluntarily cutting off enlightenment, the retaliation is apt to be in monstrous disproportion to the supposed offence. Claggett's conscience made ogres of trifles, probably arguing that the motive imputed to Billy in spilling the soup just when he did, together with the epithets alleged, made a strong case against him, justifying retributive righteousness. Nature, like Claggett's, can form no conception of unreciprocated malice. Probably the master at arms clandestine persecution was started to try the temper of the man, but had not developed any quality in Billy that enmity could make official use of or pervert into plausible self-justification. Not many days after, it was a warm night. The foretopman was dozing on the uppermost deck alongside three others. He was stirred into semi-consciousness by somebody touching his shoulder, then breathing into his ear a quick whisper. Slip into the four chains. Something's in the wind. I will meet you there. Billy had a reluctance to say no to an abrupt proposition not obviously unfriendly nor iniquitous. His apprehension as to out outside of the honest and natural was seldom quick. Besides, the drowse of sleep still hung upon him. He rose sleepily and betook himself to the designated place, a narrow secluded platform overhanging the sea. The stranger soon joined Billy Budd. There was no moon. A haze obscured the starlight. He could not distinctly see the stranger's face, yet something in the outline and carriage reminded Billy of an afterguard. The man whispered, You were impressed, weren't you? So was I, he paused. Billy, not knowing what to make of this, said nothing. We are not the only ones, Billy. There's a gang of us. Couldn't you uh, help? What do you mean? demanded Billy, shaking off his drowse. Here, the hurried whisper grew husky. The man held up two small objects, twinkling in the nightlight. They're yours, Billy, if you'll... But Billy broke in, and in his resentful eagerness, his vocal infirmity intruded. D -d Damn! I don't know what you're driving at, but you had better g g go where you belong. The fellow, confounded, did not stir. Billy, springing to his feet, said, If you don't start, I'll t t t toss you over the rail. There was no mistaking this, and the mysterious emissary disappeared in the shadows. What's the matter? came growling from a forecastleman, awakened by Billy's raised voice. 
the four topmen appeared. Ah, beauty, is it you? Something must be the matter, for you st st stuttered. I found an afterguardsman in our part of the ship, rejoined Billy, mastering the impediment, and bid him be off. Is that all you did? gruffly demanded an irascible old fellow known as Red Pepper. Such snakes I should like to marry to the gunner's daughter, meaning subject them to disciplinary castigation over a gun. However, Billy's rendering satisfactorily accounted for the brief commotion, since the forecastle men are the most jealous in resenting territorial encroachments. This incident sorely puzzled Billy Budd. It was an entirely new experience, the first time he had ever been approached in underhand fashion. What could it mean? And could those two glittering objects the interloper had held up really be guineas? Where could he get guineas? Even spare buttons are not so plentiful at sea. The more he turned the matter over, the more he was nonplussed, uneasy and discomforted. He recoiled from an overture which he, ill comprehended, but instinctively knew, must involve evil. Billy recognised him the following afternoon by his general cut and build, more than by his round freckled face and pale blue eyes, veiled with lashes all but white. Yet Billy was a bit uncertain whether it were he, yonder chap, his own age, chatted and laughed in free-hearted way, genial enough, and a rattle-brain to all appearance, rather chubby too for a sailor. In short, the last man in the world one would think to be overburdened with the perilous thoughts of a conspirator. Although Billy was not aware of it, the fellow, with a sidelong watchful glance, had perceived Billy first, and then noting that Billy, looking at him, nodded in a friendly recognition an old acquaintance. A day or two afterwards, passing Billy, he offered a flying word of good fellowship, which so embarrassed Billy that he knew not how to respond. Billy was more at a loss than before. The ineffectual speculation was so disturbingly alien to him that it never entered his mind that, from its extreme questionableness, it was his duty as a loyal bluejacket to report the matter. Yet he did disburden himself to the old dansker while sitting together on deck. But it was only a partial, anonymous account. Upon hearing Billy's version, the sage dansker, after meditating, said, "'Didn't I say so, baby bud?' "'What?' demanded Billy." Jimmy Legs is down on you. What? rejoined Billy in amazement. Has Jimmy Legs got to do with that afterguardsman? Oh, it was a afterguardsman then. With that explanation, the old Merlin gave no reply to Billy's impet. Long experience had likely brought this old man to that bitter prudence which never interferes and never gives advice. Despite the Dansker's insistence that the master-at-arms was at the bottom of these strange experiences, the young sailor was ready to ascribe them to almost anybody but the man who, Billy said, always had a pleasant word for him. Some sailors remained unsophisticated, and a young seafarer of the disposition of our athletic foretopman is much a child man. Experience is a teacher indeed, yet Billy had no intuitive knowledge of the bad in nature. But after the little matter at the mess, Billy Budd no more found himself in strange trouble about his hammock or his clothes bag. When Claggett's unobserved glance happened to light on Billy with a melancholy expression, his eyes strangely suffused with a soft yearning, as if Claggett could have loved Billy but for fate. Some of these caprices could not but be observed by their object. He thought the master-at-arms acted in a manner rather queer at times. That was all. But the occasional pleasant word went for what it purported to be, the young sailor never having heard of the too fair-spoken man. Had the foretopman been conscious of having done or said anything to provoke the ill-will of the official, it would have been different, and his sight might have been sharpened. As it was, innocence was his blinder. But the general popularity of our handsome sailor and his irresistible good nature which bred goodwill on the part of his shipmates made Billy less concerned about such mute aspects toward him whose import he could not fathom. As to Claggett, the monomania in the man, covered by his self-contained and rational demeanour, was, like a subterranean fire, eating its way deeper and deeper in him. The Indomitable was employed on an expedition when she unexpectedly came in sight of a ship of the enemy. 
The frigate, perceiving that the weight of men and metal would be heavily against her, crowded sail to get away. After a chase, she succeeded in effecting her escape. Not long after the pursuit had been given up, and ere the excitement had altogether waned away, the master at arms made his appearance, cap in hand by the main mast, respectfully waiting the notice of Captain Veer. Presently the commander, absorbed in his reflections, became sensible of Claggett's presence. Captain Veer's personal knowledge of this petty officer had only begun at the time of the ship's last sailing from home, as Claggett was in transfer from a ship detained for repairs. No sooner did the commander observe who it was that deferentially stood awaiting his notice than a peculiar expression came over him, something in Claggett's aspect provoking a vaguely repellent distaste. But coming to a stand, and resuming his official manner, he said, What is it? With the air of a subordinate grieved at the necessity of being a messenger of ill tidings, Claggett conveyed that during the chase and preparations for the possible encounter, he had seen enough to convince him that at least one sailor aboard was a dangerous character. Mustering some who had taken a guilty part in the late serious troubles and others who, like the man in question, had entered His Majesty's service under another form than enlistment. At this point, Captain Veer, with some impatience, interrupted him. Be direct, man. Say impressed men. Claggett made a gesture of subservience and proceeded. Quite lately, he, Claggett, had begun to suspect that some sort of movement prompted by the sailor in question was covertly going on. But he had not thought himself warranted in reporting the suspicion so long as it remained indistinct. But from what he had that afternoon observed, the suspicion of something clandestine had advanced. Captain Veer, taken by surprise, could not wholly dissemble his disquietude. But as Claggett went on, the former's aspect changed under something in the witness's manner in giving his testimony. Never mind that, peremptorily broke in the superior, his face altering with anger, instinctively divining the allusion to the recent mutinies by the petty officer. Besides, it even looked, under the circumstances, like an attempt to alarm him. Captain Veer did not permit himself to be unduly disturbed by the general tenor of his subordinate's report. Furthermore, something in Claggett's self-possessed and somewhat ostentatious manner strangely reminded him of a perjurous witness. You say there is at least one dangerous man aboard? Name him. William Budd, a foretopman. William Budd? repeated Captain Veer with unfeigned astonishment. The young fellow who is so popular with the men? Billy the handsome sailor? The same, but for all his youth and good looks... A deep one. Not for nothing does he insinuate himself into the goodwill of his shipmates. At the least, all hands will say a good word for him. Did Lieutenant Ratcliffe happen to tell your honour of that adroit fling of buds under the merchantman's stern when he was taken off? It is, even masked by his good-humoured air, that at heart he resents his impressment. Now, the handsome sailor had naturally attracted the captain's attention from the first. As to Billy's adieu to the rights of man, which the lieutenant had indeed reported, but more as a good story than out else. Captain Veer thought better of the impressed man for it, admiring the spirit that it could take an arbitrary enlistment so merrily and sensibly. The foretopman's conduct, too, so far as it had fallen under the captain's notice, had confirmed the first happy augury, while the new recruit's qualities as a sailor man were such that he had thought of recommending him to the executive officer for promotion. Captain Veer had from the beginning deemed Billy Budd to be a king's bargain for His Majesty's Navy, a capital investment at no outlay. After a brief pause, he weighed the import of Claggett's suggestion, and the more he weighed it, the less reliance he felt in the informer's good faith. Suddenly, he turned and in a low voice, Do you come to me? Master at arms, was so foggy a tale. As to Budd... Cite me an act or spoken word of his, confirmatory of what you charge against him. Heed what you speak. There is a yardarm end for the false witness. Claggett circumstantially alleged certain words and acts which collectively, if credited, led to presumptions mortally inculpating Bud.
With grey eyes impatient and distrustful, essaying to fathom to the bottom of Claggett's calm violet ones, Captain Veer again heard him out, then stood ruminating. Though something exceptional in Captain Veer made him a veritable touchstone of man's essential nature, yet now as to Claggett and what was really going on in him, his feeling partook less of intuitional conviction than of strong suspicion. At first he was for summoning that substantiation of Claggett's allegations which the Master-at-Arms had said was at hand. But such a proceeding would result in the matter at once getting abroad, which might undesirably affect the ship's company. If Claggett was a false witness, that closed the affair. Therefore, before trying the accusation, he would first practically test the accuser. He thought this could be done in a quiet, undemonstrative way. He determined to shift the scene to a place less exposed to observation than the quarterdeck. Captain Veer took action. Abruptly turning to Claggart, he said, Master at Arms, is it now Bud's watch? No. Summoning Albert, his hammock boy, Go find Billy Bud. Tell him out of earshot that he is wanted. Contrive it that he speaks to nobody, and not till you get here let him know that the place where he is wanted is my cabin. When the foretopman found himself closeted in the cabin with the captain and Claggett, he was surprised. But it was a surprise unaccompanied by apprehension or distrust. To a nature essentially honest and humane, forewarning intimations of subtler danger came tardily, if at all. Shut the door, sentry, said the commander. Stand without and let nobody in. Now, master at arms, tell this man to his face what you told me and prepared to scrutinise the confronting visages. With a measured step and calm air, Claggett deliberately advanced within short range of Billy, and mesmerically, looking him in the eye, briefly recapitulated the accusation. Not at first did Billy take it in. When he did, the rose tan of his cheek looked struck by white leprosy. He stood like one impaled and gagged, Meanwhile, the accuser's eyes, removing not from the blue dilated ones, underwent a phenomenal change, their rich violet colour blurring into a muddy purple, those lights of human intelligence losing human expression, jellily protruding like the alien eyes of creatures of the deep. The first mesmeric glance was one of serpent fascination. The last was of the hungry torpedo fish. Speak, man, said Captain Veer to the transfixed one, struck by his aspect even more than by Claggart's. Defend yourself. Which caused a strange, dumb gesturing and gurgling in Billy. Amazement at such an accusation, bringing out his lurking defect and intensifying it into a convulsed tongue tie, straining in an agony of ineffectual eagerness to obey the injunction to speak and defend himself, gave an expression to the face like that of a condemned vestal priestess in the moment of being buried alive. Though at the time Captain Veer was quite ignorant of Billy's liability to vocal impediment, he immediately divined it. Going up to the young sailor and laying a soothing hand on his shoulder, he said, There is no hurry, my boy. Take your time. Contrary to the effect intended, these words, so fatherly in tone, doubtless touching Billy's heart to the quick, prompted yet more violent efforts at utterance. Efforts soon ending for the time in confirming the paralysis and bringing to his face an expression which was as a crucifixion to behold. The next instant, quick as the flame from a discharged cannon at night, his right arm shot out and Claggart dropped to the deck. Whether intentionally or owing to the young athlete's superior height, the blow had taken effect fully upon the master-at-arms forehead. The body fell over lengthwise, like a heavy plank tilted from erectness. A gasp or two, and he lay motionless. Fated boy, breathed Captain Veer in tone so low as to be almost a whisper. What have you done? The twain raised the felled one into a sitting position. It was like handling a dead snake. They lowered it back. Regaining erectness, Captain Veer, one hand covering his face, stood impassive. Slowly, he uncovered his face. The effect was as if the moon emerging from eclipse reappeared with another aspect. The father in him, manifested towards Billy thus far, was replaced by the military disciplinarian. In his official tone, he bade the foretopman retire to a stateroom till summoned. This order, Billy, in silence, mechanically obeyed. Going to the cabin door, Captain Veer said to the sentry, Tell the surgeon I wish to see him. 
When the surgeon entered, Captain Veer directed his attention to Claggett. The surgeon, for all his self-command, started at the abrupt revelation. On Claggett's always pallid complexion, thick black blood was now oozing from nostril and ear. To the gazer's professional eye, it was unmistakably no living man. Captain Veer, intently watching him, said, Verify it. The customary tests confirmed the surgeon's first glance, who, in unfeigned concern, cast a look of intense inquisitiveness upon his superior. Suddenly, he exclaimed, pointing down to the body, It is divine judgment. Disturbed by the excited manner he had never before observed in the indomitable's captain, but wholly ignorant of the affair, the prudent surgeon held his peace as to what had resulted in such this tragedy. Captain Veer vehemently exclaimed, Struck dead by an angel of God, yet the angel must hang. At these passionate interjections, the surgeon was profoundly discomposed. Recollecting himself, Captain Veer briefly related the circumstances leading up to the event. Come, we must move the body, designating the compartment opposite that where the four topmen remained immured. Go now, said Captain Veer. I shall call a drumhead court. Tell the lieutenants what has happened and charge them to keep the matter to themselves. Full of disquietude and misgiving, the surgeon left the cabin. The thing to do, he thought, was to place Billy Budd in confinement and postpone further action in so extraordinary a case until they rejoined the squadron, then refer it to the admiral. He recalled the captain's agitation, so at variance with his normal manner. Whether Captain Veer, as the surgeon surmised, was really the sudden victim of any degree of aberration, one must determine for himself. The unhappy event could not have happened at a worse juncture, for it was close on the heel of the suppressed insurrections, an after-time very critical to naval authority, demanding from every English sea commander two qualities, prudence and rigour. Innocence and guilt, personified in Claggett and Bud, in effect changed places, in a legal view, the apparent victim of the tragedy was he who had sought to victimise a man blameless. And the indisputable deed of the latter, navally regarded, constituted the most heinous of military crimes. Small wonder, then, that the indomitable's captain, in general a man of rapid decision, felt circumspectness was necessary. Until he could decide upon his course, he deemed it advisable to guard against publicity. Feeling that unless quick action was taken, the deed of the four topmen would awaken any slumbering embers of the gnaw among the crew, a sense of the urgency that overruled in Captain Veer every other consideration. Though a conscientious disciplinarian, he was no lover of authority for authority's sake. So thinking, he was glad to turn the matter over to a summary court of his own officers, reserving to himself the supervision of it. Accordingly, a drumhead court was summarily convened, he electing the individuals composing it, the first lieutenant, the captain of marines, and the sailing master. The court was held in the same cabin where the unfortunate affair had taken place. On either side was a small stateroom, one room temporarily a jail, the other a dead house. All being quickly in readiness, Billy Budd was arraigned, Captain Veer necessarily appearing as the sole witness in the case. Concisely, he narrated all that had led up to the catastrophe, omitting nothing in Claggett's accusation or the manner in which the prisoner received it. At this testimony, the three officers glanced with no little surprise at Billy Budd, the last man they would have suspected either of the mutinous design alleged by Claggett or the undeniable deed he himself had done. The first lieutenant turned toward the prisoner and said, Captain Veer has spoken. Is it or is it not as Captain Veer says? In response came syllables not so much impeded in the utterance as might have been anticipated. Captain Veer tells the truth. But it is not as the Master at Arms said. I am true to the King. I believe you, my man, said the witness, his voice indicating a suppressed emotion not otherwise betrayed. God will bless you for that, Your Honour. Not without stammering, said Billy, and all but broke down but immediately was recalled to self-control by another question to which the same emotional difficulty of utterance, he said, No, there was no malice between us. I never bore malice against the master at arms. I am sorry that he is dead. I did not mean to kill him. Could I have used my tongue, I would not have struck him. 
but he foully lied to my face and in presence of my captain. I had to say something, and I could only say it with a blow. God help me. Next it was asked whether he knew of, or suspected, out of incipient trouble, meaning mutiny, though the explicit term was avoided, going on in any section of the ship's company. The reply lingered. This was naturally imputed by the court to the same vocal embarrassment which had retarded or obstructed previous answers. But the question immediately recalled to Billy's mind the interview with the afterguardsman in the forechains. But an innate repugnance to informing against one's own shipmates, along with the blind feeling that nothing was being hatched, prevailed. The answer was negative. One question more, said the officer of marines, speaking with troubled earnestness. You tell us that what the master at arms said against you was a lie. Why should he have so lied, so maliciously, if there was no malice between you? At that question, Billy was nonplussed, evincing a confusion that could be construed as hidden guilt. Nevertheless, he strove to answer, but all at once relinquishing the vain endeavour and turning an appealing glance towards Captain Veer, deeming him his best helper and friend. Captain Veer, who had been seated, rose to his feet, addressing the interrogator. The question you put to him comes naturally enough, but how can he rightly answer it, or anybody else? Regardless, the point is hardly material, quite aside from any conceivable motive actuating the master at arms, and irrespective of the provocation to the blow, a martial court must, in the present case, confine its attention to the blow's consequence. The utterance caused Billy to turn a wistful, interrogative look toward the speaker, a look in its dumb expressiveness not unlike that which a dog might turn upon his master, seeking elucidation of a gesture ambiguous to the canine intelligence. Nor was the same utterance without marked effect upon the three officers. Couched in it seemed a meaning unanticipated, a prejudgment on the speaker's part. The soldier once more spoke. Nobody is present, none of the ship's company who might shed light upon what remains mysterious in this matter. Captain Veer said, I see your drift. There is a mystery, but what has a military court to do with it? The prisoner's deed, with that alone, we have to do. To this closing reiteration, the marine soldier, knowing not how aptly to reply, sadly abstained from saying out. The first lieutenant, instructed by a glance from Captain Veer, turned to the prisoner. But, he said, if you have out further to say for yourself, say it now. Upon this, the young sailor turned another quick glance toward Captain Veer. Then, taking a hint from that aspect, a, a hint confirming his own instinct that silence was now best, replied to the lieutenant, I have said all, sir. The sentinel standing by the sailor throughout these judicial proceedings was now directed to take the prisoner back to the stateroom, the three officers stirred in their seats, exchanged looks of troubled indecision, yet knew they must decide and without long delay. Captain Veer stood, his back toward them gazing out upon the monotonous blank of the twilight sea. The court's silence was broken only by brief consultations in low, earnest tones. Turning, he came to stand before the three. Hitherto I have been but the witness. And I should hardly think now to take another tone did I not perceive a troubled hesitancy. Proceeding from the clash of military duty with moral scruple, scruple vitalized by compassion. For the compassion, I share it. But this is a case that under martial law must be dealt with. If, mindless of circumstance, we are bound to regard the death of the master at arms as the prisoner's deed, then does that deed constitute a capital crime whereof the penalty is a mortal one? Injustice is nothing but the prisoner's overt act to be considered. How can we adjudge to shameful death a fellow creature innocent before God, whom we also feel to be so? But these buttons we wear attest our allegiance to the king. In receiving our commissions, we ceased to be free agents. When war is declared, we fight at command. If our judgments approve the war, that is but coincidence. So now, however pitilessly that law may operate, we, nevertheless, adhere to it and administer it. He paused, 
earnestly studying them for a moment, then resumed. But it is not solely the heart that moves in you, but also the conscience, the private conscience. But occupying the position we do, private conscience should yield to that imperial one formulated in the code under which we officially proceed. Here the three men moved in their seats, less convinced than agitated by the course of an argument. Perceiving this, the speaker paused, abruptly changed tone and went on. The facts. In wartime at sea, a man of war's man strikes his superior and the blow kills. The blow itself is, according to the Articles of War, a capital crime. Aye, sir, emotionally broke in the officer of Marines, in one sense, but surely Bud proposed neither mutiny nor homicide. Surely not, my good man, and before a court less arbitrary and more merciful than a martial one, that plea would largely extenuate. But here, we proceed under the law of the Mutiny Act. Bud's intent or non-intent is nothing to the purpose. We must do one of two things, condemn or let go. Can we not convict and yet mitigate the penalty? asked the junior lieutenant falteringly. Lieutenant. Consider the consequences of such clemency. To the people, the four topman's deed, however it be worded in the announcement, will be plain homicide committed in a flagrant act of mutiny. The penalty for that, they know. But if it does not follow, will the sailors not revert to the recent outbreak at the Nore? Your clement sentence. They would think we are afraid of them, afraid of practising a lawful rigour, lest it should provoke new troubles. I feel for this unfortunate boy, but did he know our hearts? I take him to be of that generous nature that he would feel for us on whom this military necessity is laid. With that, he resumed his place by the porthole, tacitly leaving the three to come to a decision. On the cabin's opposite side, the troubled court sat silent. Though at bottom they dissented from some points Captain Veer had made, they were influenced by his closing appeal to their instinct as sea officers and the practical consequences to discipline. Should a man of war's man's violent killing of a superior be allowed to pass for out else than a capital crime demanding prompt infliction of the penalty? In brief, Billy Budd was formally convicted and sentenced to be hung at the yardarm in the early morning. In wartime, a mortal punishment decreed by a drumhead court follows without delay or appeal. It was Captain Veer himself who communicated the finding of the court to the prisoner. Beyond the communication of the sentence, what took place at this interview was never known. It would have been in consonance with the spirit of Captain Veer should he have concealed nothing from the condemned, should he indeed have frankly disclosed to him the part he himself had played in bringing about the decision, at the same time revealing his motives. On Billy's side, it is not improbable that such a confession would have been received in much the same spirit that prompted it. He might have appreciated the brave opinion of him implied in his captain's making a confidant of him, nor, as to the sentence itself, could he have been insensible that it was imparted to him as one not afraid to die. Captain Veer was old enough to have been Billy's father. The austere devotee of military duty may in the end have caught Billy to his heart, even as Abraham may have caught young Isaac on the brink of resolutely offering him up in obedience. The first to encounter Captain Veer leaving the compartment was the senior lieutenant. The face he beheld, one of agony, was a startling revelation. The condemned one suffered less than he who had effected the condemnation. Less than an hour and a half had elapsed. It was long enough to awaken speculations among the ship's company as to what could be detaining the master-at-arms and the sailor, for a rumour that both of them had been seen entering the cabin and neither had emerged. When, therefore, all hands were called, the crew were not wholly unprepared for some announcement having connection with the continued absence of the two men. On either side of the quarter-deck, the marine guard under arms was drawn up. Captain Veer, standing in his place surrounded by the officers, addressed his men. In clear and concise terms he told them what had taken place, that the master-at-arms was dead, that he who had killed him had already been tried by a summary court and condemned to death, and that the execution would take place in the early morning. The word mutiny was not said, 
He refrained, too, from making the occasion an opportunity for any preachment as to the maintenance of discipline, thinking the consequence of violating discipline should be made to speak for itself. Their captain's announcement was listened to by the throng of sailors in dumbness. At the close, however, a confused murmur went up. At a suitable hour, the master-at-arms was committed to the sea with every funeral honour properly belonging to his naval grade. To avoid undesirable speculations, all communication between Captain Veer and the condemned one ended with the closeted interview, the latter being now transferred under guard from the captain's quarters. The sentry placed over the prisoner had strict orders to let no one have communication with him but the chaplain. On the upper gun deck, Billy Budd, under sentry, was lying prone in irons. In contrast with the funereal hue of these surroundings, the prone sailor's exterior apparel, white jumper and white trousers, each soiled, dimly glimmered in the obscure light like a patch of discoloured snow in early April, lingering at a cave's black mouth. Over him, but scarce illuminating him, battle lanterns swung from two beams. But lying between the two guns, nipped in the vice of fate, Billy's agony, proceeding from a generous young heart's virgin experience of the diabolical incarnate in some men, was over. It survived not the healing interview with Captain Veer. He lay as in a trance, his expression taking on the look of a slumbering child in the cradle. Now and then, a serene, happy light born of some wandering reminiscence or dream would diffuse over his face, and then wane away only anew to return. The chaplain, finding him thus, and perceiving that Billy Budd was not conscious of his presence, withdrew, feeling that even he, the minister of Christ, had no consolation to prefer which could result in a peace transcending that which he beheld. But in the small hours he came again. The prisoner, now awake to his surroundings, noticed his approach and civilly welcomed him. The good man sought to bring Billy Budd to some godly understanding that he must die at dawn, but Billy was wholly without irrational fear of death. If in vain the good chaplain sought to impress the young man with the ideas of death, equally futile were his efforts to bring him the thought of salvation and a saviour. Billy listened, but less out of reverence than from natural politeness. But the indomitable's chaplain was a discreet man possessing the good sense of a good heart. Since he felt that innocence was even a better thing than religion, wherewith to go to judgment, he reluctantly withdrew. Marvel not that, having been acquainted with the young sailor's essential innocence, the worthy man lifted not a finger to avert the doom of such a martyr to martial discipline. So to do would have been an audacious transgression of the bounds of his function. Bluntly put, a chaplain is the minister of the Prince of Peace, serving in the host of the God of War. The night was luminous on the spar deck, but soon a meek shy light appeared in the east, where stretched a diaphanous fleece of white furrowed vapour. That light slowly waxed. It was four o'clock in the morning. Instantly the silver whistles were heard, summoning all hands to witness punishment. Up through the great hatchways, the watch below came pouring, overspreading with those already on deck. Another group leaned over the sea balcony, looking down on the crowd below. None spake. Captain Veer, the central figure among the assembled officers, faced forward. Below him were the marines in full equipment. The prisoner was brought up, the chaplain attending him, the genuine gospel less on his tongue than in his aspect and manner towards Billy. The final preparations at an end, Billy stood facing oft. At the penultimate moment, his words, his only ones, Words wholly unobstructed in the utterance were these. God bless Captain Veer. Syllables so unanticipated come from one with the ignominious hemp about his neck. A felon's benediction. Syllables delivered in the clear melody of a singing bird on the point of launching from the twig had a phenomenal effect enhanced by the rare beauty of the young sailor. Without volition, as if indeed the ship's populace were but the vehicles of some vocal current electric, with one voice from a low and aloft came a resonant, sympathetic echo. God bless Captain Veer. 
Yet at that instant, Billy alone must have been in their hearts, even as he was in their eyes. At the pronounced words and the spontaneous echo that voluminously rebounded them, Captain Veer, either through stoic self-control or a sort of momentary paralysis induced by emotional shock, stood erectly rigid as a musket in the ship armourer's rack. The hull, deliberately recovering from the periodic roll to leeward, was just regaining an even keel when the last signal was given. At the same moment, it chanced that the vapoury fleece hanging low in the east was shot through with a soft glory, simultaneously watched by the wedged mass of upturned faces. Billy ascended, taking the full rose of the dawn. In the pinioned figure, arrived at the yard end, to the wonder of all, no motion was apparent save that created by the ship's motion. The silence at the moment of execution, and for a moment or two thereafter, emphasised by the regular wash of the sea against the hull, was gradually disturbed. It resembled the first muffled murmur of a torrent's sloping advance through woods. The seeming remoteness of its source was because of its murmurous indistinctness, since it came from the men massed on the ship's deck. Being inarticulate, it seemed to indicate some capricious revulsion of feeling, a sullen revocation on the men's part of their involuntary echoing of Billy's benediction. But ere the murmur had time to wax into clamour, it was met by a strategic command, the more telling that it came with abrupt unexpectedness. Pipe down the starboard watch, bosun, and see that they go. Shrill as the shriek of the seahawk, the whistles of the bosun and his mates pierced that ominous low sound dissipating it and yielding to the mechanism of discipline. The throng was thinned by one half. The remainder was set to temporary employments connected with trimming the yards. The hammock, which had been Billy's bed, had already been ballasted with shot and prepared to serve for his canvas coffin. When everything was in readiness, a second call for all hands was sounded to witness burial. But when the tilted plank let slide its freight into the sea, a second strange human murmur was heard blended now with another inarticulate sound proceeding from the sea-fowl, whose attention having been attracted by the peculiar, flew screaming to the spot. So near the hull did they come that the bony creak of their gaunt, double-jointed pinions was audible. As the ship passed on, leaving the burial spot, they still kept circling it low down, with the moving shadow of their outstretched wings and the croaked requiem of their cries. Upon sailors as superstitious as those, the action of the sea-fowl, though dictated by animal greed for prey, was significant. An uncertain movement began among them. It was tolerated but for a moment. Suddenly the drum beat to quarters sounded, a sound happening twice every day, and had a peremptoriness in it. The drum beat dissolved the multitude, distributing most along the two gun decks. There, the gun's crew stood by their respective cannon, erect and silent. In due course, the first officer, sword under arm, formally received the successive reports of the sordid lieutenants commanding the batteries. All this occupied time, which was the object of beating to quarters at an hour prior to the customary one. At this unwanted muster, all proceeded at the regular hour. The band on the quarterdeck played a sacred air, then the chaplain went through the customary morning service. That done, the men in orderly manner dispersed to the places allotted them. It was now full day. The fleece of low-hanging vapour had vanished, licked up by the sun that late had so glorified it. Truth, uncompromisingly told, will always have its ragged edges. Hence the conclusion of such a narration is apt to be less finished than an architectural finial. How it fared with a handsome sailor during the year of the Great Mutiny has been faithfully given, but though properly the story ends with his life, something in a way of sequel will not be amiss. On the return passage to the English fleet, the Indomitable fell in with a French battleship, the Atheist. An engagement ensued. Captain Veer, in the act of putting his ship alongside the enemy with a view of throwing boarders across, was hit by a musket ball from a porthole of the enemy's main cabin. Disabled, he dropped to the deck and was carried below. The senior lieutenant took command. Under him, the enemy was finally captured and taken into Gibraltar, an English port. There, Captain Veer, with the rest of the wounded, was put ashore. He lingered for some days, but the end came. Not long before death, 
he was heard to murmur, Billy Bud, Billy Bud. But these were not the accents of remorse, which seemed clear from what the attendant said. Some weeks after the execution, there appeared in a Naval Chronicle, a weekly publication, an account of the affair. It was doubtless for the most part written in good faith, though rumour falsified the facts. On the 10th of the last month, a deplorable occurrence took place on board HMS Indomitable. John Claggett, the ship's master-at-arms, discovered that some sort of plot was incipient among an inferior section of the ship's company and that the ringleader was one William Budd. He, Claggett, in the act of arraigning the man before the captain, was vindictively stabbed to the heart by Budd. The enormity of the crime and the extreme depravity of the criminal appeared greater in view of the character of the victim, a middle-aged man, respectable and discreet, a petty officer whose function was a responsible one and whose patriotic impulse was strong. The criminal paid the penalty of his crime. The promptitude of the punishment has proved salutary. Nothing amiss is now apprehended aboard HMS Indomitable. The above, appearing in a publication now long ago forgotten, is all that stands in human record to attest what manner of men respectively were John Claggart and Billy Budd. Everything is, for a term, remarkable in navies. Any tangible object associated with some striking incident is converted into a monument. The spar from which the foretopman was suspended, even a chip of it was, to the blue jackets, as a piece of the cross. Ignorant though they were of the secret facts of the tragedy, and not thinking but that the penalty was somehow unavoidably afflicted from the naval point of view, for all that, they instinctively felt that Billy was a sort of man as incapable of mutiny as of willful murder. They recalled the fresh young image of the handsome sailor. Their impression of him was doubtless deepened by the fact that he was gone, and, in a measure, mysteriously gone. At the time on the gun decks of the indomitable, the general estimate of his nature and its unconscious simplicity found utterance from another foretopman. Gifted with a poetic temperament, the lines, after circulating among the shipboard crew, finally got printed as a ballad. The title given to it was The Sailor's Billy in the Darbies. The End We hope you've enjoyed this recording from 